We will now begin the Southeastern National TB Center's Grand Rounds, the Global Control of TB, Implications for TB Elimination in the U.S. Please note that today's presentation is being recorded. To provide some housekeeping information and, in and an introduction of the speaker, we now turn to Karen Trail. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Southeast Southeastern National TB Center Clinical Training Campus here at A.G. Holly Hospital. And this morning, we have a wonderful presentation for you um, with video streaming. Um, we have, um, if you do not see the picture, please click on the voice and video button at the bottom of your screen. We have many upcoming FNTC events for you. There's a contact investigation course, August 18th through 19th in Montgomery, Alabama, the Comprehensive <coughs> Clinical TB course, September 14th through 17th here at Lantana, the Tuberculin Skin Testing Train the Trainer course, September 18th here at A.G. Holly, Grand Rounds again in October on October 7th, Why TB Drugs Fail, the webinar and live audience here at A.G. Holly Hospital, followed by morbidity and mortality rounds via webinar and live here at A.G. Holly Hospital. Thank you very much. We're going to be getting started in just a few minutes. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Wonderful July here in South Florida. Uh, it's always, as usual, a nice cool day here, breezy. Um, we're all different jackets right now. Uh, it's been a little chilly, yeah, right? Uh, one of the nice things about being here at E.G. Holly uh, is uh, you know, is that uh, if it's 95 degrees outside, we're going to try to make it 98 inside, you know. But uh, no. well, first of all, welcome. It's great to have all you here, and uh, we're so, so honored. I know I say this every time, but uh, it seems that every Grand Rounds gets topped by the next, and I've got to say today is definitely that culmination. Um, we're so, so lucky to have uh, Ken here today giving Grand Rounds on, I think, one of the more important topics, which is where are we going and what challenges do we face and how are we going to face those challenges? And uh, i got to say to you that uh, if there's ever been a more timely talk it couldn't be more than today. I mean, because with all everything that's happening around us and everything that's happened in the last couple of years, you know, all of us are kind of wondering where are we going to be tomorrow? What are we up against? What do we have to do? And I think you'd agree in these times when you have that, leadership becomes so, so important. And we all, lead, you know, we all look to our leaders. And i got to tell you that... Uh, I uh, have known Ken now for, uh, we were just talking about this, about 16 years. When I first started at Holly, one of the first things I had the opportunity to do was to go to the CDC. And I remember that was huge for somebody who was just starting in tuberculosis. I had the ability to go and see the head of TB, the head of the CDC's TB program, and there was Ken. And I remember still to this day, and we joke about it, Ken gave this really amazing talk about DOT and how he was going to, and implement and how he was going to lead us right into the full implementation of DOT and how he was going to bring us down to the possibilities of elimination of TB. And you know what the bottom line was at the time, and I know it doesn't seem now, but at the time that was when TB was back on the rise. MDR was now threatening all of us. 3% of all our cases in the United States around that time were MDR, and it didn't look like there was a light. And Ken at that time talked to us about a light. And you know what? The light came true. And as you know, right now we're at the lowest rates of TB that we've seen since we started reporting TB in the 1950s. And it's been thanks to Ken's leadership and the work that all of you do that we're here. But I think you all agree we're far from the end. You know, we have a long way to go. And we need to know where do we go next, especially with the challenges now that we're facing with economics, that we're facing now with the, unfortunately, 
the increase of resistant strains of TB that we never even dreamed about 15, 20 years ago. And I remember at that time, after the lecture, when I met, you know, I, I wanted to speak to Ken. I went up there, and one of the key points that I really enjoyed about Ken was afterwards, I was able to go up and introduce myself. And I, you know, was a young physician. I was not used to going up to leaders, you know, and they definitely would never acknowledge me. And one of the most amazing talks I remember when I went up to Ken, and after this amazing talk, I went to thank him for it. I went up and I introduced myself, and he acknowledged me. And he made me feel part of the family. And that meant so much to me. It really made me want to do more. And I've got to say, over the years, every time we've asked Ken for anything or we ask him to explain, he's always responded. And I've got to say that what I appreciate most about Ken is not just his leadership and what his visions are and how he's really taken us, but most importantly, who he is. And I'm hoping today, during his lecture and during the questions, again, we will be able to interact We'll be able to learn from Ken, but most importantly, I think we'll be able to really share Ken. And that's been one of the key points, you know. Ken today is going to be talking about the global challenges to the elimination of TB. As you guys know, he's the chief of the division of TB elimination. He's a rear admiral. I love that he came dressed up in his whole regalia. I'm all jealous and stuff like that. And bottom line comes down to is today, I promise you, at the end of this lecture, right, all of us will have, I hope, the inspiration to get our goals taken care of once and for all, that we will, and I hope we will, eliminate TB and what challenges we have. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Castro. Ken, thank you so, so much for being here today. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Uh, I was kind of concerned that you were not going to leave me time to give a presentation. Um, yes, I am in uniform. I am a member of the uh, U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps Career Officer, um, and we have, um, over the last few years, implemented pretty much mandatory daily uniform wear. If left to my own device, I would be wearing a nice linen Guay de Vera, which I own, uh, and it would be much more appropriate uh, to Florida, but I certainly wear this uniform with pride. Um, the concept uh, that I'd like to share with you today uh, is a title that I came up with uh, when I was first invited by Lee Reisman to give grand rounds in New Jersey on the occasion of the Ray McDonald uh, lecture that they have around World TV Day. The presentation is not the same, but the concept certainly is uh, an evolving concept, and I'd like to share that um, with you. And for starters, uh, Let's um, also share a slide that I developed for my presentation uh, last month with the National TB Controllers. Uh, uh, when you look at tuberculosis, and Dave has already alluded to that, we're really at a, an incredible crossroads. Uh, and I'm uh, inspired by Charles Dickens' uh, opening um, uh, statement in The Tale of Two Cities. Uh, where he describes it was the best of times and the worst of times. It was the uh, age of wisdom, the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief and the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light and the season of darkness. It was the season of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, and we had nothing before us. Doesn't it sound like uh, TV elimination in the United States? Uh, so what I'll try to share with you is what I see constitutes uh, our being in the best of times. Uh, Dave has already alluded to the fact that we have the lowest incidence of tuberculosis recorded in the history of the United States. Uh, we have fairly effective programs. We're at the cusp of being able to roll out new diagnostic tools and new interventions to make our jobs a little bit less labor intensive than what it now is. On the other hand, it is the worst of times because uh, we're the victims of our own success. Tuberculosis does remain a leading infectious killer of young adults throughout the world. Um, the, I, I've uh, mentioned uh, the fact that uh, many programs in several states uh, have been scaled back uh, because of the perception that there's no longer a problem. Uh, therefore, there are limited resources to mobilize when we have clusters of tuberculosis. 
And we also have a very limited capacity to scale up and do what needs to be done. Um, here we are looking at all these new diagnostics, and what we really need to do is do field testing, see how these behave under real life conditions, and start using them. Uh, that requires the resources that we do not necessarily have. Here are the data. Uh, the slide depicting uh, the incidence and number of cases from 1982 to 2008. And um, the period um, shown in this part of the curve from 1985 to 1992 was the unprecedented resurgence of tuberculosis. Uh, we took several steps to recover from that, and we have. For the last 16 years, we've had a decline in tuberculosis incidence. However, please pay attention to the fact that the annual percent change has slowed down in recent years. From the year 1993 to 2000, the annual percent change was 7.3. And from the year 2000 to 2008, it's uh, now you know, almost uh, half of that, uh, 3.8. With uh, work that uh, Jose uh, Becerra and Andrew Hill in our division have been doing, uh, trying to forecast and model, uh, they've shown that if we keep going at a decline of 3.8% uh, per year, arriving at our target of one case per million, which is the definition of elimination in the United States, is going to take us 100 years. And every time I say this, I remind people that although I am interested in job security, I'm not interested that much in job security. Um, we do need to gain um, annual percent change of 8.8 .8 to uh, shave elimination by 50 years. So there's a, a scale up that needs to take place to get us there sooner than uh, we're going. Uh, here is a graph uh, that uh, depicts the number uh, and percent of persons uh, reported with multidrug resistant TB by year through 2007. And as you see, we've uh, been successful at uh, decreasing that to no more than 1% uh, in the country. Um, other really exciting aspects uh, that I've already mentioned uh, are the new tools, the interferon gamma release assays for, uh, as aid for the diagnosis of latent tuberculosis. We've already issued uh, two sets of guidelines and are in the process of issuing an updated set of guidelines given the most recent uh, FDA approval of the T-spot test as well as the 2007 approval of Quantiferon TB Gold in tube. Um, we've also tried to make better use of nucleic acid amplification tests. Uh, this is our trick to overcome a slow-growing bacterium that uh, takes several weeks uh, to, rep uh, well, it takes actually 18 to 24 hours to replicate, but several weeks to, to see growth uh, in culture or in solid media. Um, this is an excellent tool to get same-day diagnosis, and a set of recommendations have been issued. Uh, another really interesting component uh, is what has happened in the political commitment sphere uh, that we know is key to uh, tuberculosis control globally. After many years of hard work by many partners uh, and uh, some enlightened elected representatives, uh, the Comprehensive TB Elimination Act of 2008 was enacted into public law, authorizing $200 million uh, for fiscal year 2009 with annual cost of living increases until 2013. Um, also, the uh, so-called PEPFAR um, has been reauthorized as the Hyde Lancet's U.S. Global Leadership against HIV, now it includes tuberculosis and malaria, and that authorizes up to $4 billion for tuberculosis over a five-year interval to combat global tuberculosis. Um, having said this, I will be the first one to point out that both of these are authorities, not appropriations. Not a single penny has been spent uh, uh, as part of these, uh, so we still depend on elected representatives to make the appropriate um, 
appropriation of these resources. Uh, however, there's been the recognition in the form of public laws, and we hope that they will serve um, the programs in the future. So here are some of the challenges to TB elimination uh, as we see them. Uh, there's a slowing rate of decline in cases uh, and a residual pool of persons latently infected with tuberculosis. Uh, there's a disproportionate burden of disease among racial and ethnic minorities, and I will share some more information about this with you, as well as an increasing proportion of cases among the foreign-born reflecting the global burden of tuberculosis and the theme of this uh, presentation. We also have growing antimicrobial resistance elsewhere reflecting uh, and showing up right here in the United States, as well as the uh, never-ending problem of HIV-associated comorbidity uh, especially in countries that are being ravaged by the HIV epidemic. Uh, then last uh, but not least, the budget erosion and losses in human resources have limited our capacity to do what needs to be done. Here's a graph uh, showing uh, the uh, case rates uh, from 1993 to 2007 uh, stratified by the race and ethnic groups um, that we can get from the U.S. Census. So as you can see, the rate in 2007 for Asian and Pacific Islanders was 26.2. Uh, um, um, for non-Hispanic uh, blacks, it was 9.4. And please contrast that to what it was for non-Hispanic whites, 1.1. So the good news is that the rates are going down for all groups. The bad news is that the disparity remains uh, over time. And we need to do a better job at this. Uh, the other component uh, that we see in our country is that as the number of persons with tuberculosis among the U.S. born has decreased in our country and the number of persons who are foreign born remains uh, more or less stable, uh, they now account for 59% of all reported cases in our country. Uh, this is uh, what I call the global reality becoming a reality in our own shores. Another very interesting component to uh, the uh, trends with multidrug resistant tuberculosis is that the impact uh, in the United States has been mostly in U.S. born persons. The rates of multidrug resistant TB are at least twice higher in the foreign born individuals who reside in our country and get diagnosed with tuberculosis. Um, lastly, uh, in terms of these trends, uh, these are the most recent data based on the National Health and Nutrition Survey uh, done in 1999 and 2000, showing an estimate of the number of uh, persons with latent uh, tuberculosis. The overall prevalence in the non-institutionalized uh, U.S. population is 4.2%, accounting for almost 11 million persons ranging from about 9 to 14 million latently infected individuals. However, look at this. Uh, in U.S. born, it's 1.8 percent. In foreign born, it's almost 10 times higher. Also, TB plagues uh, the poor. By using a poverty index uh, that's a composite of um, uh, average income um, in families, this people with a lower poverty index, i.e. those who are of lower socioeconomic background, have almost uh, twice uh, the rate of tuberculosis. And you also see reflected what we saw in the earlier graph uh, uh, in terms of non-Hispanic black and uh, non-Hispanic white, the rates being uh, quite different. When you look at the persons who are born outside the United States reported with tuberculosis in our country, 24% of them are from Mexico, not surprising. Our country shares a 2,000-mile-long border with the country of Mexico. And uh, the rest are from Philippines, uh, from Vietnam, India, China pr primarily. Um, what you will see in the next slide is that except for Mexico, all those other countries are listed among the 22 countries that account for 80% of the global morbidity. Uh, according to WHO, in 2007, there were 9.2 million new tuberculosis cases, accounting for 1.7 million deaths. Here it shows the incidence of tuberculosis, and you see India, 
and China accounting for the highest uh, incidence, but certainly um, countries like Philippines, Vietnam, um, are showing up in the list of high burden countries. Another uh, interesting uh, component of monitoring trends globally, uh, here you have the regions of the world uh, as uh, defined by WHO, different epidemiologic regions. And what you see in this graph is that from 1990 to 2007, uh, the rate uh, went up in Africa by almost 200% uh, in the 1990s with more recent declines. The other place uh, where the rates uh, went up um, was in Europe uh, with about a 40% increase in the 1990s and a flattening more recently uh, while it was going down in the Americas and uh, other parts of the world. Africa is uh, the continent uh, where we have the highest rates of HIV infection fueling the tuberculosis epidemic. And this map is color-coded to show uh, the incidence of tuberculosis per 100,000 population. And in purple, um, dark purple, what you see, especially in southern African countries, are countries where the rate of tuberculosis is more than 300 per 100,000 population and where the rates of uh, HIV infection in persons attending TB clinics is at a minimum 50%. Therefore, you're talking about an environment where at least one out of two persons who walk into the clinic is HIV infected. In some places like Malawi, the rate of HIV infection in the TB clinic is about 77%. So this gives rise to a scenario that I have almost jokingly said to my colleagues at WHO, TB clinics in Africa are an HIV clinic in disguise. And if we don't uh, acknowledge that and work on treating the patients for their HIV uh, infection, we're going to be missing the boat. And obviously it's something that the world has recognized and actions have been uh, undertaken. And it's part of the PEPFAR strategy uh, to deal with uh, HIV uh, throughout the world. Why uh, is HIV a problem? Uh, well, there are multiple challenges. I've split them on the left-hand side into diagnostics and management challenges. Uh, on the diagnosis side, you have a typical chest X-ray, relatively positive alphabary of the C, so you're less likely to see sputum smear positivity, and a lot more extrapulmonary TB, especially with advancing HIV infection and, and immunodeficiency. On the management side, uh, you have the nightmare of drug-drug uh, uh, interactions between the anti-TB and antiretroviral drugs. Then you have a situation that adds insult to injury where you're treating individuals for these two conditions and by introducing antiretroviral drugs, reconstituting their immune system, you make them worse. Uh, they, and in fact, uh, some of the one of the earliest and best papers was uh, out of uh, A.G. Hawley, where Masa and Arita and Dave were co-authors of a description of these uh, what was called then paradoxical reactions. The immune reconstitution inflammatory sy syndrome requires that we be mindful of it, anticipate it, educate patients so that they don't run away when you give them drugs. To make them better, but they get worse. You know, this doctor is a lousy doctor in any culture of the world. Uh, so be aware of uh, the need to address this up front. Um, I'm going to uh, not uh, pay attention to the table on the right hand side uh, because it really uh, is a repetition of what I've already said, and I'd like to get to a few other things. Um, the next topic that I want to really talk about is the occurrence of multi-drug resistant TB. And Dr. Lee Reisman is probably uh, watching this from uh, New Jersey and uh, pleased to see that I'm featuring the front cover of the book he co-authored uh, with Dennis Hopkins um, entitled Time Bomb and describes the, what to anticipate with the global epidemic of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So for starters, let's make sure we're all on the same plane um, by making sure that uh, we uh, have the definitions clear. Multidrug-resistant tuberculosis are strains of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis 
resistant to at least isoniazid and rifampin, the two most powerful drugs against tuberculosis. Extensively drug-resistant TB are a subgroup, as demonstrated in this diagram, developed uh, by Peter Sigelski at CDC, a subgroup of uh, strains with MDR with added resistance to the quinolones and at least one of the three injectable second-line drugs, uh, such as amicacin, canamycin, or capriomycin. And we've seen uh, bad outcomes for these uh, persons, and I'll show some of that uh, later on. Uh, as part of a series of surveys that have been conducted uh, throughout the world dating back to 1994, most recently published in 2007, uh, WHO has estimated that globally there are close to 500,000 persons with multi-drug resistant TB, uh, approximating 5% of all incident cases in 2007. And this is based on 138 settings surveyed in 116 countries during that time interval. As many of you would be able to anticipate, uh, globally, persons who've never been treated for tuberculosis, the rate of MDR is about 3%, going up to about 15% uh, for those who've been previously treated. Now, there are parts of the world, such as Eastern Europe and Eastern Mediterranean, where if you've been previously treated for tuberculosis, 35% of these patients uh, show up with MDR-TB. So you can imagine what a nightmare it is for treating these individuals given the limited available options, especially in many of these countries where access to the second-line drugs uh, has been traditionally fairly limited. This is a very busy slide, um, and uh, I show it uh, to illustrate, uh, one, it's an excellent um, meta-analysis uh, published by Evan Orenstein and colleagues uh, from Yale and working in South Africa, uh, looking at a variety of studies uh, that, and the outcomes of treatment. Uh, so on the, uh, what you have on these columns, and I have circled here, is uh, the treatment success for persons with MDR in the various studies uh, by individualized treatment, and you have 64% treatment success, uh, ranging from 59 to 68% when you look at the 95% confidence interval. In settings where standardized treatments were used instead of individualized, that uh, they didn't have access to individual drug susceptibility data, but they had um, information from surveys, the outcome is slightly uh, worse, 54% uh, overall, However, it's not statistically distinct. Uh, the 95% confidence interval overlaps, and it goes from 43 to 68% uh, success rate. Um, in a study that was done by um, Bayer Lemain and the colleagues from Latvia, from our group, Tim Holtz has been working with them, they uh, described uh, the, occur the outcomes of treatment for persons who met the case definition for XDRTB compared to all other MDRTB patients. And what you see here is that if you had MDRTB, the likelihood of success is about 50, 65%, going down to no more, less than 30% in this particular setting. And of course, the failure rate and then is uh, over 50% with the presence of XDRTB. In the United States, they, well, the, the story about XDRTB became well known as a result of the description in South Africa of a cluster of individuals who were attending a clinic uh, for antiretroviral treatment, and many of whom ended up dying of extensively drug-resistant TB. So the authors of this report, uh, Neil Gandhi and other collaborators from South Africa, described 53 persons, 52 of them, and 98% died. And all the other indicators suggest uh, that this form of tuberculosis was being transmitted by exposure in the healthcare setting. You can see uh, the large proportion of individuals who had never been treated, who had been previously hospitalized, as well as the matching genotypic uh, fingerprints. And uh, only 44 of the 53 were tested for HIV, but all of them were positive. This uh, was a bit of a deja vu for those of us who've been working in tuberculosis in places like Florida and New York, 
uh, this particular paper by Charles Wells uh, describes a series of uh, outbreaks of MDRTB that were primarily associated with HIV infection. Look at the rates of HIV infection in the affected population from 91 to 100 percent. Death rate unacceptably high, over 72 percent. And the time interval from diagnosis to death from 4 to 16 weeks. Um, we've also described more recently the occurrence of extensively drug resistant TB in the United States with a worse uh, outcomes compared to pan susceptible tuberculosis cases. Uh, this busy slide is meant to portray that even in the United States, the death rate for people with XDRCB is unacceptably high. Um, the time for conversion is much longer. So as a result, you have individuals in the community who are shedding these nasty bacteria um, while undergoing treatment with suboptimal drugs. Worldwide, uh, WHO has reported as of the end of March that more than 50 countries have uh, notified uh, or reported the presence of extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. And uh, the thing I would like to bring to your attention is that these countries in Africa show, uh, show up blank. It's because we're collectively ignorant. It's not because they are not there. It's because we are ignorant of our own peril. We are not measuring, and therefore we are unaware of what's happening. We're hoping to change that by work with WHO the Africa Regional Office, and many others. So um, coming back to what I see needs to be done, uh, we obviously need to maintain support for the core activities, and I'll be saying some more about what are these core activities. We need to retain expertise as cases decrease, and that's a big challenge. Um, it, I do not expect for clinicians and nurses in our country to remain proficient in the management of tuberculosis if they don't see any case of tuberculosis. Uh, so we need to come up with mechanisms uh, to overcome that deficiency. We also need to have the capacity to respond promptly to outbreaks and clusters, especially in those settings in states where the public health infrastructure has been eroded down to the last public health nurse who's doing maternal child care, immunizations, foodborne diseases, and tuberculosis. So when when that person is confronted with a cluster of individuals with TB, they are ill-prepared to go out and find the, the persons in the time that it's required to test them and identify other cases or latently infected individuals. We also need to do a better job at uh, providing targeted interventions to high-risk groups. Um, hope to have convinced you that we need to focus efforts on foreign-born and global TB, focusing on HIV-associated tuberculosis, and drug-resistant tuberculosis, um, and clearly, uh, as exemplified by the presence of XDRCB, we need better tools for treating individuals who are running out of treatment options and being thrown into the pre-antibiotic era. The control activities in the United States uh, consist of primarily identifying persons with tuberculosis, doing drug susceptibility testing, and treating them until cure, relying on patient-centered, directly observed therapy, promoting adherence, uh, coordinating programs, uh, you know, making a, uh, taking advantage of the fact that very often our programs are just across uh, the hallway in the health department from the STD program, very often serving the same population or the HIV-infected individuals. And I think we are not achieving the optimal sense of collaboration and service integration. From the patient perspective, they don't care who's going to take care of them. They need the services. So whether you call yourself the TB program or the HIV program, you know, what they need are the services. And the other thing we need to do, and uh, many of you who heard me speak before have heard me say this, um, we cannot make their job impossible. Don't ask someone to come to the HIV clinic on Monday and on Thursday to the TB clinic across town uh, as opposed to while you're here, let's make sure we deliver the services for both. I can tell you that if you were to ask me, I would come to one of the two visits because I'm too busy at work and I'm not going to take time off work. That's human nature. We need to acknowledge that and make sure that our programs are responsive to those needs. 
uh, we I reiterate the need for uh, responding to clusters and outbreaks. As TB goes down, we see clusters occurring, these sporadic outbreaks, and uh, a, a limited capacity to respond to them. Uh, Lab-based diagnosis uh, using PCR-based technology, making sure that we're doing comprehensive contact investigations, identifying secondary cases as well as latently infected, making better use of, of some of the uh, aerosterone and gamma relief assays. Uh, as you know, CDC is funding uh, two laboratories, one in California, the other one in Michigan, for systematic genotyping of all isolates of them tuberculosis as a way to better assess the transmission dynamics. We're finding that with this tool, sometimes we identify uh, clusters that had not been readily identified through the shoe leather or more labor-intensive epidemiology. And when we've gone back, we've been better able to work with the local health department to then uh, try to bring those clusters under control and interrupt the chain of transmission. Um, guidelines for uh, contact investigations have been issued, as well as I've mentioned for chronic uh, uh use. Um, now we're going to be talking about interferon gamma release assays that include quantum on the T-spot. We're also uh, paying attention to in infection control precautions, and this is key, especially in those parts of the world where it's been neglected for so long. When you look at what's the role of clinicians um, throughout the country, I expect clinicians to be uh, adept at establishing the diagnosis, at um, I contributing to the proper airborne uh, infection isolation precautions and reporting and working then ideally with the, uh, well, and ideally knowing what drugs to start, but if they don't know, certainly pick up the phone, reach one of the four regional uh, training medical consultation centers in the country to be guided through this process and also work in partnership with the local health department to um, extend the ability to get uh, the contact investigated. Very often, you know, I remember myself as a medical health staff officer uh, in charge of an outpatient clinic, and if I saw someone with a condition that was of infectious nature, I'd put the onus on the individual. Please bring me your relatives so I can get them tested. Clinicians will, you know, if that's their practice, uh, will do that, and they need to partner with the health department who's capable of deploying outreach workers to get the work done and help uh, really get uh, the overall work done. The other thing we need to pay attention to is uh, how to facilitate treatment of persons with latent TB, uh, looking at alternatives to the optimal uh, nine months of isoniazid, especially in individuals who have been exposed to an incident or short case with isoniazid resistance. Rifampin for four months has been recommended, um, not on the basis of the same clinical trial that had been randomized as uh, happened for Eisenheiser, but with fairly good results and some recent studies that Dick Menzies showing a very good safety and tolerability. Um, the other thing that I will point out to you is that in the United States we've been a bit too, perhaps arrogant is a strong word to use, but we haven't... Uh, paid as close attention to what uh, other colleagues have done in other parts of the world. The United Kingdom has been using for many years Eisenheiser and Rifampin for three months for children exposed to adults with uh, TB disease and are showing fairly good outcomes. And I think we need to do a better job at understanding how to incorporate that as part of our options uh, in policies for treatment of persons with latent infection. There's an ongoing study that will look at uh, once is looking. Uh, I shouldn't say will look. Uh, at the uh, more than 8,000 patients have been recruited, are being followed, and uh, they're receiving isoniazid and rifampicin, a long-acting rifampicin, once weekly for three months. That's 12 doses. If this stuff is good, I can tell you that we're going to try to push for this to be used. Uh, also, especially if it's well tolerated, obviously. Uh, and I keep harping back to the need to in investigate the uh, clusters. Another thing not to lose sight of is the need for uh, establishment and follow-up infection control precautions. During the resurgence of TB in our country, one of the deficiencies we identified was that we had stopped paying attention to infection control precautions. 
I'm already seeing a sense of complacency setting in as TB rates go down, as we no longer see the number of healthcare workers coming down with tuberculosis. But I can tell you that this is uh, paramount and as, as part of the interventions in the armamentarium, and we need to pay close attention to access to airborne isolation, uh, airborne infections isolation rooms. And we're using this nomenclature to have these rooms be uh, of service to uh, conditions other than tuberculosis. Uh, you could think of influenza, SARS, and what have you. The other uh, key component of what we need to do is have good labs to establish the diagnosis and become educated consumers. Work with your lab. Call them up. They're trying to provide you with a service, um, and you should, in turn, demand for the turnaround time with quality assured testing. Florida has a very good lab and uh, other parts of, uh, of the country do, but there are places where uh, you know we've been involved in providing assistance to outbreak investigations and what you see is a shameful occurrence of um, results not available. Results sent but not available. And that to me is unacceptable in 2009. And uh, as an educated consumer, we need to go back and find where are the bottlenecks that need to be resolved. We also obviously need to do better uh, for second-line drug susceptibility testing. It takes too long while you're sitting on a patient trying to decide what drugs to give optimally. There's um, work done with the Association of Public Health Labs um, talking about the future of TB labs and using a systems approach that pays attention to specimen collection, transport, quality assured testing, and a result coming back in time. It's what they call the pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic phases of lab testing and paying attention to the whole spectrum. Uh, usually, you just focus on the analytic. What is the test like, et cetera, but very few people are paying attention to Who's transporting the specimen? Is it too hot? Is it sitting in the car, especially here in Florida? Um, and when are the results coming back? Um, these are the four regional training medical consultation centers and the areas of Southern Today, of course, we find ourselves uh, in Lantana, uh, part of the Southeastern uh, National Tuberculosis Center. And what we've uh, aimed as to accomplish through these cooperative agreements is make sure that any clinician or nurse in the country who needs access to expert advice can get it. And so if you're in Montana, you should be able to call your assigned to the Curry National Center. If you're in Maine, uh, you call New Jersey and so forth. And if you're in Tennessee, you call uh, this center here, if you're in Oklahoma, you call the Heartland uh, Center. But as you can see, we have the country covered. There's room for improvement, plenty of room for improvement. But at least I'm satisfied that we have attained a state where people in different parts of the country, um, when they call, we don't find ourselves saying, oh, I don't know who you should call, try calling this, that, the other. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about how to then scale up this capacity beyond what we're already doing, and I'm sure that uh, this may be a source of questions uh, later on. Uh, diagnosing MDRTB and XDRTB requires a heightened index of suspicion by clinicians, and uh, this is a, a PDF uh, uh, copy of the um, of the training materials that came out of the San Francisco Center on treatment of MDR. Uh, medical management of uh, multi-drug resistant TB has been issued um, and most recently updated uh, by WHO um, as an emergency update to account for the need uh, to deal with persons with XDR TB. In general, the guidelines are um, to rely on the various um, drugs and drug families, thank you. Um, and uh, I will just uh, say this is based on this most recent iteration. Uh, rely on one drug from uh, aminoglycoside or polypeptide classes, ideally uh, a quinolone 
and as many as needed from the thioamide cyclosterone or paraminosalicylic acid to bring the total of five effective drugs. And I've quoted from that report, regimen should consist of at least four drugs with either certain or almost certain effectiveness. Uh, therefore, ideally you will have uh, drug susceptibility results available to you for the management of these individuals. This is very complex. It, rely, it, it really requires that we access experts. Uh, um, remember when in television they used to show people doing stunts and they would remind you never try this at home? I would say the same thing uh, to people who don't treat persons with multi-drug resistant TB and who are confronted with a person who has uh, been diagnosed with MDR TB. If you're not doing this for a living or uh, doing it frequently, don't try it by yourself. Uh, make sure you reach out to the experts uh, because the regimens are fairly complex. They have incredible side effects that we need to manage. And there comes a time when if, uh, if you're running out of options, you need to then throw what I call the kitchen sink uh, and look at other drugs that have shown in vitro activity but have never been studied outside observational uh, uh, clinical series reports such as uh, clopazamine, imipenin, amoxicillin, provulonate, uh, which is augmented, the macrolide, and lodesolid, um are also considered uh, you see also the consideration for using surgery, the minimum duration of treatment included in here, and uh, you will have access to the slides, therefore I will not pretend to turn you into MDR TB treatment experts uh, by going through the details. You can do harm. Yes, we can do harm. Here's a modeling um, done by Sally Blower uh, showing that as we increase the management of persons with MDRTB in the world uh, under suboptimal conditions, we are going to be generating uh, extensively drug-resistant TB. In having breakfast with Dave this morning, we were talking about uh, next, it's not going to be hard to predict total drug resistance as we then manage people with uh, extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. Um, I'm close to ending. Uh, these are other unmet needs as I see them. Uh, we need to be able to provide effective referrals and care for complicated persons uh, who have tuberculosis, usually with multi or extensively drug resistant tuberculosis or with underlying conditions that require hospitalization and therefore need access to airborne isolation precautions while they're uh, housed uh, to receive that care. Another um, area that we haven't done well with is um, how to repatriate individuals uh, who, as a result of their TB disease, we ask them to be placed on do not board travel list and as a precaution. Many of them are stuck, in, and we have discussed a case that was seen right here of an individual. Um, who was a student, uh, had a student visa, had to be treated for multi-drug resistance TB, but his visa was expiring and we were not allowing that uh, young man to go back to his country of origin. So he's stuck in a country requiring treatment, not being allowed to travel, and without health insurance. We put people in a catch-22 situation, and we really need to grapple with this and solve it rather than continue the hand-wringing uh, forever. So I'm very interested in working uh, through CC and the department to try to find ways um, to help uh, TB controllers in our country where we're also going to need the help from TB controllers because uh, the solution is going to be a multifaceted uh, solution. But uh, I just find this downright unacceptable. Um, the best of times, uh, it's amazing that after years of a dry spell, we're now sitting on really exciting technology. I've touched on the inter uh, interferon gamma release assays, and what I'm showing here is a table that uh, comes out of a uh, systematic review by Maru Pai and colleagues uh, from McGill in Canada, showing the excellent sensitivity and specificity in different settings uh, for 
the various available tests uh, and often beating the tuberculosis skin test in some settings. Um, another test uh, that I know is being used uh, here is the Hine test. Uh, this uh, was uh, a, a version uh, to both identify TB as well as multi-drug resistance. Uh, 536 consecutive AFP positive specimens from patients had increased for multi-drug resistance tested, uh, and I quote from the paper, tested in a busy routine diagnostic lab in Cape Town, South Africa, and look at um, the specificity of 100% in identifying drug resistance, 100% uh, positive predictive value. And you're able to get that result uh, in a time when it makes a difference to the treatment of the individual. The data have been so compelling that WHO, who usually lags behind us in issuing guidance, jumped ahead of the United States and of Canada and other industrialized uh, countries and uh, is exhorting the use of line probe assays uh, under a series of conditions that, again, you will have access to the slide. I'm not going to go uh, through the details, but they were very careful to identify what are the underlying conditions that need to be met uh, for these athletes to be useful. But as of um, a year ago, uh, they have gone out and made this public uh, policy statement. Um, as far as new drugs, uh, this is what the pipeline is uh, looking like. I'll say some more about uh, the viral quinoline uh, TMC-207 since uh, there was a recent report in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, but all of these drugs have in vitro activity against multi and extensively drug-resistant TB, and they're in different phases of clinical trials. Uh, here's uh, the graph showing uh, the placebo arm versus the uh, group that uh, had uh, TMC-207. Uh, all patients had multi-drug resistant TB, and they were treated with an optimal background regimen plus placebo or optimal background regimen plus uh, TMC-207. And as you can see, a larger uh, number of individuals converted to uh, culture ne uh, negative. The data are showing here the, uh, those who remain culture positive. So the, in this group, 52% as compared to 91% were still culture positive several weeks later if they were taking placebo instead of the diarrheal quinoline containing regimen. Uh, another very promising drug um, is uh, the one being developed by Otsuka. Uh, showing in vitro very strong bactericidal activity, not cross-persistence with other anti-TB agents, and they've already mapped out a strategy to develop phase one, two uh, uh, studies. And um, there's discussion with several developing countries to test this regimen out. Another very exciting development as recent as June 3rd, uh, the FDA Anti-Infective Drug Advisory Committee got together and decided to use um, uh, regulatory authority available to uh, FDA for accelerator approval of new drugs for serious life-threatening illnesses and looking at the approval of uh, these drugs for M or XDRTB, quote, on the basis of adequate and well-controlled clinical trials establishing that the drug product has an effect on a target endpoint likely to predict clinical benefit. And the likely endpoint for this is going to be sputum conversion within six months, culture conversion within six months, not having to wait until the 18 to 24 months to complete therapy and to follow these individuals for the potential of accelerator approval. Several drugs, especially some of the more recent um, antiretroviral drugs for HIV have been approved using this regulatory authority. Um, Rifapentine, it turns out, was also approved that way, Clorifero for disseminated mycobacterium, even intracellulari or complex. Um, ARAS uh, uh, has been working on a series of compounds that look promising for potential vaccine. To me, this would be the way to go. I would love to be able to close shop and become part of the immunization program because we had such a great and effective and safe vaccine. 
but it's going to be a while before we're there. Uh, this is more of the same. Uh, in the United States, we have a plan to combat an exemplary drug assistant TB, addressing lab needs, surveillance, infection control, clinical and program interventions, touching on ethical and legal issues, communication education, research, uh, strategic partnerships, as well as cost analyses. Um, we're in this business uh, for very clear reasons. Uh, we want to treat individuals so that we can reduce individual suffering and death and protect others. This is one of those few interventions where every time you cure an individual with TB, you're having a benefit at the community level because you're preventing the transmission of the disease to others. Um, excellent programs for diabetes, hypertension, don't have that community impact. Uh, they will benefit the individual, uh, but there's uh, nothing to be gained by others around them other than the well-being of an individual, which is obviously something we all look forward to. But this is one of those areas where the intervention is your strongest public health uh, aspect uh, for the um, benefits that you're aiming to achieve. Um, let me leave you with my vision of what the future TB program intervention should be ideally. I think we need to be at a state where, uh, and I think this is somewhat realistic on the basis of what we see coming down the pipeline. Two month curative regimens that are well tolerated with relapses that are no worse than what we now see, or ideally better, with the uh, regimen that we use for pan susceptible TB, with options for treating persons with multi and extensively drug resistant TB that are not as toxic and do not require 18 to 24 months. Rapid, and by rapid I want results within two days, and reliable DST, um, and really get the results in time to help manage the individuals. Accurate blood assays for M tuberculosis that ideally identify those at highest risk uh, for disease progression. Um, obviously, um, since I'm asking, I'll go for it all. I'm going to ask for a safe and effective vaccine. For uninfected and lately infected persons, uh, both in the U.S. and globally, uh, an enhancement of the public and private partnerships. Uh, Dave and I were chatting a bit about this, how we really need to do better uh, in this component uh, in our country and elsewhere. Make sure that the affected communities are at the table. We really need to bring the consumer of our services and do what in business they call the 360-degree evaluation. How are we doing by you? Um, and, you know, again, uh, those of you who know me have known me to ask, uh, how many of you would go to the very same clinic that you serve? Would you want to be a patient in that waiting room? And if the answer is no, then I rest my case. There's something remarkable that needs to happen and change in that setting. Um, obviously, we need ready access to airborne infections, isolation room facilities, and care for exceptional cases as I've alluded to, and we ought to have that. Um, I'd like to close by acknowledging uh, the consultants who've helped us develop the updated guidelines, our advisory council, TB controllers throughout our country, Stop TB USA, which played a key role in uh, some of the legislation that has been enacted, as well as in an ongoing development of a grassroots uh, strategic plan for eliminating uh, tuberculosis. Obviously, the regional training and medical consultation centers, uh, the professional societies who are we're, we're partners uh, with, um, primarily American Thoracic Society, Infected Disease Society of America, American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Association of Public Health Labs, the federal TB task force that serves to bring together various uh, federal agencies, and we're getting together on the 26th of August. And obviously, last but not least, the staff uh, from our division, both in headquarters and the field. Thank you for your attention, and I hope we have some time for a question that you might have. Thank you so much. No, 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 wait, 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 no, no, you're not going nowhere. You're not going nowhere, but you can get, you know. Well, first of all, as I told you, Ken was fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Um, and, you know, I really, really appreciate it, and I especially loved that you, that you dreamed there for a second. You said if you wanted to get it, you would get it all, and that's, I think, how we all should be. You know, I guess one of the key points 
that I, I think uh, that's been made, I think, most recently in all of the recommendations that have come out from, let's say, the WHO or the CDC is this change in philosophy, the philosophy that the public health sector should be the leader. And something very interesting about TB, that the responsibility of curing patients with TB should not fall upon the patient, but actually should fall upon the society, upon us as leaders in public health, you know. But I think when you looked at your list there, I think those were all lists, all things to be honest with you that are achievable. Right. But the question comes down to is not can we do it, because I think we can, but will we have access? And how do we, and how as leaders do we gain access? And I'm just wondering, I know me and you, you know, we've talked about this for a long time, but I think one of the big issues is that, you know, I always talk about that you could be a great master craftsman, but if you don't have the tools you need and that are, that you have at your disposal, you can't build something. And I'm wondering, I think, you know, especially in the United States, one of the things that um, at least I feel is that I think we have the resources to do what we need to control TB. I didn't say eliminate it, but control it. But we have trouble with access to it and making sure that every person has access to expert care. And I was wondering, Ken, like, how do you feel about that, and how can we uh, kind of maybe get there, you know? Uh, I think we can ask our, uh, the same question of our president, who's uh, grappling with uh, how do we deal with health care reform, uh, uh, and a topic that we as a country haven't adequately addressed. Um, and at the heart of that discussion is the recognition that we have over 40 million uninsured individuals. And in the case of TB, we know that many of these foreign-born individuals are at times uh, not legally in the United States and therefore uh, are not um, gaining access to the key services. Uh, I think we need to build very compelling arguments uh, for why it's justified to use taxpayer dollars to treat persons with tuberculosis, um, given that um, if we didn't treat them, they would continue to be sources of infection in the community. They might be, I would hate to use scare tactics that would then have the adverse consequence, but they could be your domestic worker. Uh, they, you know, these are the people who we are interacting with when we go into the local uh, ethnic uh, restaurants with the fantastic food that um, they all bring. Uh, so uh, I think we need to build that compelling case uh, and in fact, uh, I've recently been thinking and suggesting that in the same way as we were convinced by those who were elected most recently to use taxpayer dollars to bail out the banks and the auto industry, why not use taxpayer dollars to bail out public health infrastructure? Uh, and the argument we were told was, if we don't do this, we're going to be really sorry and we cannot afford to do it. I think we have, in my opinion, we have the same argument. We cannot afford to allow the public health infrastructure to erode to the point where diseases go unmitigated in our communities because then they're going to have us all hanging by our heads. Um, the problem is uh, building that compelling argument with the health econometrics that are going to be required uh, so that the people who are sitting at World Bank and other places um, uh, and in our own country can actually uh, do some of that. But the other component that I'd like to touch on when you ask about access, so I just dealt with the access from the perspective of having health insurance uh, and, um, uh, yeah, primarily having health insurance. There's another component to access, and that is the attitude we have in our clinics. I mean, I've been to clinics where, you know, you just I walk out of there and I say, I want to fire everyone here. Yeah, because the, uh, <laughs> well, no, no, fortunately, Fortunately, that has been very infrequent, but I have been to places where I've seen a patient show up at the clerk's desk, and the response is, what do you want? Is that the way you want to be received if you were going into the clinic? Uh, oh, I was sent here by the outreach worker. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, this is the interaction that we see taking place in our clinics. To me, that's limited access because I will walk out of that clinic and never want to walk into it again in spite of the fact that it's open, and by the way, it's usually open at very inconvenient hours for me who have a day job, uh, so it's not open early enough in the morning nor late enough at night. It's open at our convenience, those who are working there. So the other thing, so those are other components of access that deal with the biosocial um, component.
segments of the populations we were supposed to serve that we also need to grapple with and try to address. And I think you'd agree, Ken. It's not only just access to the patients, which don't get me wrong, I think it's tremendously important. But if we're going to be leaders to the people who take care of these patients, meaning the private community, the private right. providers, we have to be accessible to them. I mean, we have to understand the pressures they're under and be able to get them the answers they need rapidly and painlessly. Right. And that should go for both the patient as uh, well as the, 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 the uh, advisor or the consultant. And I, I think, you know, a lot of, you know, for most patients, most I think most states have the resource to do, but on those difficult cases that you alluded to, I think one of the biggest problems is the, the resources to treat these patients, to diagnose these patients, exist in the United States, but not necessarily for every provider. And they're not necessarily available to every patient. And I guess, you know, if one thing we learned from the speaker case, one of the things he said, which I thought was always compelling, he said he wished that every patient with tuberculosis had access to the same expert care he did. And in some ways, I think that should be our goal. And I think that's what absolutely. you were getting there when right. you were saying that, you know? Right. No, absolutely. As, as, as we've spoken, you know, in the early stages of TB control, you wanted to gain the most benefit for the largest number of people. But as you get there, I think we should include everyone. I mean, it, it, we shouldn't aim to get, um, you know, the WHO targets for uh, 1995 were to find 70% of incident cases and cure 85%. Many of us who've worked uh, with our colleagues at WHO have underscored that that should be a floor, not a ceiling. You should do that as a minimum, and that ideally um, you should, you know, care about every single individual uh, at a program level, that's a bit more difficult. That's the attitude of the private uh, provider who's confronted by the individual. Uh, when you're dealing with population-based uh, interventions, then you start looking at uh, the benefits uh, for the largest number. Uh, but again, getting back to our uh, very, uh, as you can imagine, we had a very healthy conversation over breakfast uh, uh, this morning. And you know, I kept getting is Ken, you know, getting up, going, I gotta go, I gotta go. We, <laughs> so we have to go. Yeah, see, isn't it time to go? I, I didn't realize why you were so anxious to get here. You know. That's actually not true. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, the uh, I illustrated to you a case uh, that I came across uh, of a woman working in New York from Ethiopia, who was struggling to try to get medicines to her. 19-year-old niece who was residing in Addis Ababa and where the local clinicians were saying, don't even try to get them because we don't have the facilities. And so, you know, covering the masses is fine until it comes to those close to you and your loved ones. And, and that's why we need to adopt the attitude of everyone counts. And, and that's also the reason why in my dream list I included, we need to have the affected communities at the table. Not only the patients, but those who live with them and who have been put through the misery of the treatment uh, and the humiliation at times uh, that we put them through so that they can give us the reality-based feedback so we can temper our actions. You're right, Ken, and, and I've got some credit, but I just want to throw that up. But that's why those studies that come out about XDR and MDR, where we were talking about cure rates of 50 to 70 percent, and then saying in the editorials or saying in the articles that those are successes, those are not successes. Those are failures. That means anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of these patients are continuing to walk around with MDR and we're not addressing them. And I think that you're right with what you say. The answer should be that we should not be satisfied until every last patient is, has the access to care and is cured. And until that time, everything else is, I believe, is, it's a progress, but it's still not considered a fail, uh, you know, a success. You know. Um, let me uh, first of all, let me start by saying first of all. You know, obviously we're going to be opening up for questions, so you have a couple of different ways you can ask the questions. Uh, for, for you guys here, I'm going to turn it over to you, and I'll ask everybody in the audience if they have questions, and please ask. For those guys who are listening to us on the phone or on the webinar, if you, at this point, the operator is going to give you some instructions on how to ask a question by phone, and please go ahead and, and do that and uh, tell the operator you have a question. We'd, be, we'd love to hear you. Or if you could actually ask your question also online, and I'm about to ask a question here online, by just uh, writing in the question, and we will then answer it. So please uh, go ahead and ask questions. But, Tim, we actually have a question from Jason going about. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. Your line will then be briefly accessed to obtain some information. If your question has been answered and you wish to, with wish to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. Once again, to register a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4. Young lady from Ethiopia, I mean, you know, these are what's happening. It's heartbreaking. Well, I mean, the first thing is you need a phased approach. So first things first is you need to have a good decent TB control program that's not manufacturing drug resistance, uh, then you also need to pay attention to those who exist who now have uh, drug resistant TB. I think that most of our countries uh, need to, and in fact it's already happening, most of the established market economies, uh, or at least a few of them, are the ones contributing most heavily to the global funds for AIDS, TB, and malaria, and that has become the largest source of funding for many of these uh, programs. Um, the justification was very nicely presented by a study published by Kevin Schwarzman and uh, folks from McGill University, in fact they were CEC collaborators, where they showed the return for the investment in dollars spent by countries like the United States and Canada in helping improve TB control and reducing TB incidence in countries where most of our cases originate. So, you know, looking at places like some Caribbean countries as well in, as Mexico um, in our case. Uh, that publication was accompanied by a very nice editorial uh, entitled Enlightened Self-Interest, uh, the reason for us to do this. In addition to that, I'll say that um, the United States has a very proud history that we often don't look at when looking at how we've dealt with other global diseases. The United States was uh, front and center in the global eradication of smallpox, ironically, with Russia at a time of Cold, cold War. Um, more recently, uh, polio virus is not circulating in our country. Uh, there are a few countries where it's still present, but there's a, a, a polio eradication campaign in the United States that's contributing to that. Uh, we see that larger benefit. We don't have much in the way of malaria, yet we're contributing to that. Measles eradication. So in TB, I think we need to uh, strike the right balance. We can't rush and work overseas and forget about the domestic work. But we need to continue domestic work while continuing to improve the situation overseas to reduce the influx of uh, cases that are generated overseas. The other thing that this accomplishes is when we all travel overseas, we're also protected. Because uh, some more draconian individuals would re recommend erecting fences and limiting the influx of uh, foreign-born individuals. But that does nothing to protect our citizens when we're all sent overseas. Uh, we have troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, we have uh, individuals who I, we get calls at CEC. I'm being sent by my bank to Southeast Asia for the next year. What should I be concerned about? Uh, or someone who says, you know, my spouse who is from country X has MDRTB. I'm wanting to come back. What should we do? So we're not uh, isolated, and we need to behave as a global community. But I think that's exactly right. I think that's what we really got to get to our legislators. And I think the time is right, especially with everything going on with swine flu. I know it's something that's near and dear to your heart. But public health is a true homeland security. And I know that may be a term that may be falling out of favor, but it truly, in the, in the truest sense, we are protecting ourselves. Right. And it's not about treating. I always hear this, why should we treat them? Why should we give money to them like they're right. them? Them is us. Right. And by treating everybody, we're protecting ourselves. And I think that's really, we need to ride the wave right now where people are really aware of diseases and how they can affect us and how anywhere in the world something happening can be in our living room and in expressing that it's not about, quote, unquote, them. It's about all of us. Well, uh, the, the way I, I'd uh, frame that is I, I, I hate using the scare right. tactics. Uh, I think we could very readily use health as a foreign policy tool. Right. That would be the way I would frame it. Actually, uh, what we have is we have a question here, and then there's a bunch of people all, all over the place that want questions. So, Ken, okay, we'd be you, happy to. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for your excellent presentation, Dr. Castro, and thank you, uh, Dr. Asking, for your brilliant remarks. Uh, I have a question. Uh, 
I'm Manuel Lorenzo, the TV program manager in Palm Beach County Health Department. And, and here is the question. Uh, as, as you outlined, we are in the middle uh, of a very difficult and challenging, challenging situation. And uh, the thing is how we keep the TV control program solid among the public health priorities in a situation in which we have a steadily decline in the number of TB cases for many years, at least for 15 years. And uh, at the same time, we have to complete, to compete for public funding with other programs and priorities. And when also federal funding are assigned in taking into consideration the number of cases that are reported in a jurisdiction. That's my question. I mean, in the middle of a current context and with the tools that we already have. Uh, if I had an easy answer to that, none of us would be sitting around here uh, today. Uh, so it, it is an excellent question and one that we're grappling with. I have uh, an opinion to offer, and that is that um, while I firmly believe in the need for these categorical programs that keep you focused uh, with uh, very uh, clear outcomes uh, that you measure and provide oversight for, I don't think we need to be categorical in the delivery of services. I alluded to some of that during the presentation. And um, I, I must say that we need to be honest with ourselves and with the public and acknowledge that we have not optimally used our collective ability to use each other to help carry out this big load. Um, most people who we see in the TB clinic have some form of comorbidity. What have we done to work with a diabetes clinic, with the HIV clinic, uh, with uh, the uh, drug rehab programs, uh, with the programs that provide housing to homeless individuals to not only care about their TB but improve, use that as a thin edge of the wedge to improve their overall health? And I, I think that's where our categorical vision, when it becomes too tunnel vision, becomes our own worst enemy. So the approach here is to try to reach out to other existing programs and see how we can use each other um, without losing sight. And there are non-negotiables as far as I'm concerned. I will work with you as long as we don't lose sight of the fact that I want to find every person with TB, get them treated until cured. Don't give me a, a, a program that loses sight of that. We also want to do the outreach work. Well, it turns out that that's exactly what the STD workers are doing and are very proficient at that. And very often they're out in the same neighborhood that we need to go and deploy an outreach worker. So how do we make better use of what I talk? But, you know, it, those who talk business parlance uh, call it other people's money uh, or assets. Um, it's the concept of, uh, you know, how do you mobilize resources that are not within your span of control so that you can get a better outcome? Easier said than done. This is a lengthy conversation at CEC. Our own national center has a unit called Program Collaboration and Service Integration, trying to do a better job with the programs that uh, our national center houses, which includes HIV, STD, hepatitis, and TB. And I think that that would be one approach to pretend that at a time of such an economic crisis, we will grow the resources to um, protect programs that are perceived to deal with a relatively low morbidity. I mean, let's face it. I mean, if you go with the numbers, tobacco use is more important uh, by sheer numbers at population level than TB. Now. I don't like to pick one to see if against the other uh, because then there's no winner. Um, so what we need to do is do a better job at being honest and open about uh, these conversations and see how we um, come to the table. And as I said, 
And as I come to the table, I'll be the first one to take out of my pocket the list of non-negotiables. You know, I will work with you as long as I don't have to give up on these things. And if I don't give up on these things, I'm happy to cross-train our TB workers in HIV prevention and STD uh, and hepatitis, uh, et cetera. And I expect some reciprocity also. So when the you're seeing patients do a better job at screening for TB and help us then accomplish that collective gain. Um, again, I, I must acknowledge that it, it comes out so easily out of the mouth, uh, but in reality, it's so hard. Actually, I think we have, and yeah, we'll be right back, but I think we have a couple people on the phone, so I'd like to take some people from the phone. So, operator, uh, could you uh, have the first person ask a question, please? Absolutely. Our first question comes from the line of Mike Lizardo. Please go ahead. Uh, hey, hi, Ken. Uh, this is Mike Lizardo, and uh, welcome to Florida. Um, I, I really wanted to be there. Um, hold on, I got to turn on the echo. I really wanted to be there, but after watching Dave on the webcam with uh, a tie on, I'm not sure I could handle that trauma. But uh, hi, Mike. Yeah, hi, Dave. How are you? I just thought I'd, I'd have to. I had to give that one little little parting shot in there. But uh, the question, though, in all seriousness, though, is that. One of the things that's always been in the back of my mind with, although obviously the expansion of access to antiretroviral therapy around the world, particularly in Africa, is obviously a very good thing and an ethical thing and obviously needs to happen for a, a whole bunch of reasons and is overall a good thing. I've always been concerned on the impact of the access to these drugs without, as we've learned in TB, an adequate program to support it, and uh, worried about the impact of drug interactions and the possibility of uh, malabsorption, which is more common in these patients. Um, what are your feelings on the potential role for generating new cases of drug-resistant TB in the face of antiretroviral therapy? Do you think it's a, a big issue, a uh, still unknown issue? Do you think it's played a significant role in what's happened in sub-Saharan Africa? Just if you could expand on that a little bit. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, uh, I think it's a very big issue, and it has become a reality. Uh, it's no longer the theoretic threat. We saw it first in the United States, uh, and in that slide that uh, tabulated the experience in Argentina, Italy, and Spain shows how all you need is to cluster a group of persons with immunodeficiency and have someone coughing in that private waiting room uh, with tuberculosis to see the bad outcomes. Um, that then became patently manifest in KwaZulu-Natal and the Trugela Ferry outbreak that has been reported. Um, actually, what, one thing that's really interesting is that uh, they have continued to look in other settings uh, in the surrounding areas. They're seeing more of the same strain circulating. So. What we need to do is not use this as an excuse to stop the advances in antiretroviral therapy rollouts, but to do things right just as you were outlining. You need a good program that pays attention to the details, and there's always a difference in the details. You can't say, okay, I'm going to hand them the drugs and they're on their own. Um, we need to have careful monitoring of these individuals. We need to make sure that we address the most common opportunistic disease in that setting in that part of the world, which happens to be tuberculosis. And in this setting, um, it's remarkable to me. I have observed a very palpable uh, awakening to the clarion call as a result of the reality now being described in South Africa. It, it, there was a sense of uh, voyeurism while it was happening in Florida and New York and other parts of the world. But once it hits home, um, all these individuals are speaking very seriously about the need to implement infection control precautions, which, by the way, I would want to see them implemented with outcome measures. You know, what are you gaining? Are you showing me that the TB rates are being reduced, and one thing that you don't hear much about is, is that dirty little secret that many people who work in TB develop TB themselves, and um, we just don't uh, use that as ammunition for uh, galvanizing political commitment and will. Um, so we just need to uh, get the programs operating well. Uh, you can predict. In fact, look at this history of tuberculosis program implementation. 
and you can then start enumerating the what some people call predictable surprises that are going to come about when rolling out antiretrovirals. You, you can see um, uh, stockouts of drugs possible in places where you don't have good management practices. You can see the um, introduction of uh, antiretroviral resistance because you provided this elective pressure. And if you don't mind uh, adherence to therapy, that is going to happen. Um, the side effects, uh, we've already seen them described. So these are the issues that we do grapple with. Fortunately, um, I am convinced that uh, the people who run the FAR program out of the United States and the Global Funds for AIDS, TB, and malaria have seen the need to pay close attention to this and to invest in these uh, programs so that they're done well. Uh, when I sit with the coordinating board of the Global Stop TB Partnership, there's someone there from the Global Fund for TB, uh, AIDS, and Malaria. I've noticed that I work on TB. I put TB first. Uh, but they, and it's clear to us that they're looking to make sure that their investments don't cause more harm than good. Uh, so the, the data have been quite convincing, and I would hope that we don't see more disasters before we see solutions being implemented. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate much. it. Love you. See you later. Um, hey, uh, I'll, actually, well, I'll we'll, we'll have to share why I better. Call uh, from uh, on the phone. Is that correct? Our next question comes from the line of Stephen Scares. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. Castor, I really enjoyed your presentation. It's very informative. Unfortunately, about halfway through your presentation, the video, the um, slides uh, would not show up. I could a red um, a pointer moving around, but there was no slides, whereas I had the slides earlier in the presentation. I uh, wasn't sure if this was just my system or if this was a problem other people had experienced as well. Did, did you pay your fee to access that? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, we, we will make sure that you have access to the slides. Uh, uh, Donna has told me that uh, they will be made uh, available. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know. And I hope that if there are others uh, who were listening and have the same problem that they communicate back uh, with Dave and Donna so that uh, we can make sure that you get access to the Actually, flight. I can also tell you that that was the new CDC way of telling the states that they've been cut off their funding. Sure. So, uh, sorry, sir. No, we, uh, as Ken said, we do apologize. We'll look into that, and we're, we'll see if anybody else had that problem. If not, and not, you know, if not, please, afterwards, we will contact you and see what we could do to help you. But thank you for that feedback. Operator, do we have one more question? I know we have two more, but if we have one more question in, uh, on the phone, and then we'll go to the audience and then some, the, uh, some questions we're getting, uh, you know, online. So uh, I think we have one more, Operator, please. We have a, operator, do we have another question on the, on the phone line? Our next question comes from the line of Tim Cobb. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Uh, Jim Cobb with the Bureau of TV and Refugee Health at Tallahassee. Uh, welcome to Florida, Ken. Thank you. Why are you not here? Yeah, Jim. Jim. The, the, uh, the uh, budget has been cut for our travel. Yeah. <laughs> Jim, don't tell us that your, your video cut out, too, because that would be bad for Florida, right? But, uh, yeah. I should tell everyone uh, listening in that uh, Jim and I worked together when I was a uh, young budding epidemiologist uh, spending time here in West Palm Beach in Belle Glade. Uh, and uh, Jim was uh, one of the uh, investigators with the health department. So um, we managed to do some uh, really interesting work together. But go ahead. What's your question? Good. Uh, actually, it's a question and a comment. Um, first of all, I do want to thank and really um, pay note to CDC. Uh, Florida has been um, a very, very large recipient of the support and, and especially financial assistance um, from the formulary and how it's been applied to states like Florida. Uh, Florida has, uh, re has also received tremendous response from CDC as we speak with an FE8 investigation on an outbreak of TB in Duval County Health Department. So, uh, you know, again, thank you. CDC has been very, very good to Florida. Um, at the same time, can you, you identify that relationship that we had? Uh, this is my 30th year in public health that I'm starting, and 
if Florida was ever a poster child for uh, collaborating and integrating programs and how it failed, um, it, it was publicized. Um, and, and I want to stress, I'm not saying that it can't work, but it has limited applicability. Um, one of the things that Dave and I often comment to each other um, it's not so much the TB case increases that we see or the ups and downs and swings of morbidity in Miami and Palm Beach and Orlando and Tampa, but when we start seeing large increases in our rural areas, uh, especially uh, when it's Gadsden County right outside Tallahassee or if it's in Marion County or XYZ County where you don't have uh, manpower, it exists at all. You only have a nurse. Um, granted, in rural areas there might be an STD worker only, but what I'm going to say is that yes, we do need to expand and, and, and amplify what resources we do, honestly, to say are we doing as what we could do in terms of collaboration and service integration, but I think we are seeing a tremendous economic stimulus throughout the United States, including Florida, and in public health programs like immunization. But, however, we're not seeing the workforce stimulus. And I think with the nurses survey that pointed out that in 10 years, 75% of our nurses, TB nurses, with so much experience will be gone. They'll be retired. So number one, when I looked at your list of interventions, I think boots on the ground is, is what's going to be imperative. And in, in, in the real deal, it's, it's not going to impact as much as we think it is because STD, in terms of service integration, are hurting themselves. Um, so I'm, I'm going to make that plea. Secondly, information technology. We, this week, are just on the verge of turning the light switch on for the first time of reporting our cases through a FINS messaging system utilizing HMS. HMS is our flagship electronic uh, patient medic uh, management system. In fact, Pinellas County is one county that has gone totally to an electronic health record. What we've done within Florida um, by ourselves to go from TIMS to where we are now with electronic disease reporting is remarkable and we certainly have to thank CDC with the help that we've gotten. But Florida is the biggest refugee health program in the United States, yet we have a system known as EDN that we have refugees uh, that are coming and showing up into our clinics that may or may not have TB, but we don't receive the notifications until after they've been seen by the clinician. So we've seen a system that has gone from paper to electronics. However, what we're seeing is a system that's failing us. And I think that I mentioned about a couple of years ago at the ASAP meeting, the mothership of IT needs to come back to the planet. And we need to service the areas of not just EDN, but electronic lab reporting, electronic notification, Genotyping, Florida, we are at a, at a point in time now, thanks to Dave Ashkin and others that are saying we need to get real-time genotyping in place. We need to, we are so good at putting data in systems, but we're terrible at getting data out. Thank you. Thanks, um, Jim. Uh, a couple of um, remarks. I very much appreciate and by and large uh, agree with your comments. Um, First remark is um, the experience uh, that was seen in Florida when there was an earlier effort to integrate old programs into uh, an amorphous mass uh, needs to be a lesson to others who try this again. In fact, I, I will, uh, I will uh, remind you that under the Clinton administration there was a first effort to health care reform that failed uh, incredibly and then that was just taken out of any public discussions only to be resurrected now under President Obama and um, what you have is an issue that hasn't been adequately addressed. I would suppose to you that equally uh, we have an issue that hasn't been adequately addressed and earlier efforts that have failed should not be used as the limitation to continue the discussion and move in new directions better informed 
by failures. And in fact, uh, what gives us the biggest lessons in life are usually the failures, not the successes. Um, and I, I agree with uh, the need to use uh, data for decision making. Otherwise, uh, it, its collection is never justified. Uh, but thanks for your comments. I think we have a question here, Dee. I did have a question. I wanted to go back to the earlier part of your presentation where you spoke about 100 years um, at our current rate. It, that's what would be required to have before we could reach our goal. And one of the things that you talked about, and I think Jim mentioned this as well, um, that relates to the model that we're using. You know, certainly a public health model, but in TB, we've become very reliant on reporting of cases to the health department. And what we're seeing here now is an increased number of children who are being diagnosed with uh, tuberculosis. And that tends to be the canary that's saying there is a lot of cases in the community. But the hospitals and physicians may not be capturing these cases, uh, primarily because they don't have health insurance. What we're also seeing is our children are being exposed but the cases are reported to have gone back to their native country. Mm. And so this also touches on not only TB in the United States or in Palm Beach County locally, but internationally because we are not able with the current model to capture, treat, and work towards the elimination of TB. So I, I think what I'm suggesting is perhaps the paradigm that we're using we need to look at that again. And this will really speak to the need to increase workforce because if we're going to wait, and this is not the only thing we do, but primarily our cases are reported. And without a good, strong case finding um, effort, we are really not going to be able to pick up cases and therefore we are not going to reduce the transmission. Uh, thank you for your comments and I would agree. In fact. Part of that uh, modeling that I described but didn't get into um, is attempting to identify what are the interventions that are going to make a difference. And it is very clear through that uh, ongoing work that we must address the pool of future TB cases presently in our communities in the form of latently infected individuals. Um, I do think that we need better diagnostics because uh, we have this rudimentary skin test. Uh, that's the test we love to hate. And then to add insult to injury, if you find someone, you tell them, you need nine months of ice and ice, you're healthy, but we're going to give you a drug. You can't drink. You can't do this. That. And if I'm healthy, doc, don't, don't take me there. So we need also uh, regimens that are much more uh, realistic to achieve that. Um, the goal of treating persons with latent infection is usually the second priority that's never addressed by any country because everyone's stuck with priority number one. We can afford to pay attention to priority number two in the United States, and we ought to uh, by doing a better job uh, at it. And as we do, I think we will serve as the arrowhead for other countries to take a look and do a better job. WHO recommends that children in households where there's an adult uh, with TB be evaluated and treated uh, with isoniazid, but it's seldom done um, because the resources just are stretched to do uh, active cases. I think with not a lot more, the, the added cost uh, of doing that when you're already in the community treating the adult is fairly minimal. Uh, you can rely on the same out, outreach workers, et cetera. Now, both you and Jim Cobb earlier have alluded to the need for a trained uh, workforce that's going to replace an aging cohort. And that, that's key. That's been recognized up and down in every aspect of public health. And it's um, at the front of and center of discussions uh, in the global sphere. And the same thing holds true for all these programs that are being rolled out. If you don't have the people on the ground who are trained and hired to do the work, it ain't sustainable. And uh, so that's the reality we, we are also confronted with. And I, paradoxically, 
you know, when we were asked, uh, what would you do if you got any stimulus money, we said uh, our program consultants were asked to call around the country and identify how many people have been either forelowed, laid off, or not uh, rehired if they retired um, over the last three years. They identified about a thousand people nationwide, and if we had gotten any of the stimulus uh, money, that would have been a way to rehire that workforce. Um, but unfortunately, it went to other areas. I would hope that over time we're uh, a better able to do um, a good job at this key component. Yeah. By the way, just 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 be one. I'm sorry, but. This way everybody can hear you on the web, too. So I, I, thank you for your discussion on the LPBI, but I just want to add, I think that we're also missing cases. Yes. And I think that th that really is uh, part of the problem. We're seeing our number of cases reduce, but at the same time we're seeing children who are now active mm -hmm. TB, which suggests that we're missing the cases right. and really not having an opportunity to uh, prevent right. the transmission. Thank you. I, I would recommend that you try to document that um, better because there's nothing more compelling than the data that you could amass to show the number of children exposed to adults who've been traveling back to country of origin uh, to then identify another um, unaddressed uh, problem. Um, but uh, it, 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 this is clearly an area that needs uh, closer attention. When we've looked in the United States in the past, it doesn't look like we're missing much in the way of cases, unlike other countries. So that's why I'm, I'm inviting you and exhorting you to uh, document that, to dispel the notions that we carry with us that, you know, TB uh, reporting and identification in this country is fairly comprehensive and complete. It's not 100%. Um, but uh, given that that's what we have to operate with, uh, you know, we need to then find what ammunition will lead us in a different direction. Ted, we, we actually got this well on the topic of resources. Uh, we got a question here from the Tennessee TB Control, and they have a very interesting question. They say, uh, direct observed therapy is a necessary component of the overall treatment and care of patients in the United States. However, it's uh, labor intensive and costly for TB programs in the U.S. What are your thoughts on increasing the number of persons receiving video DOT or DOT via webcam? This method saves money, and if the ultimate goal of DOT is to ensure com uh, completion of treatment, this is one way we can perform DOT more efficiently. Um, I, I firmly believe that if you can do it, show me that you're achieving the ultimate goal. I don't care how you get there. You know, if you want to take the side road or the highway to get there, that's fine. Um, but. I do want to see evidence that the people who are placed on video-based uh, monitoring of adherence are indeed achieving the completions. And if they are, then by all means I will applaud it. And that then in turn becomes a justification to fund that method, uh, especially if you show that it's at a cost uh, saving over deploying multiple outreach workers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Ken, I, and I agree with you 100%, and I think it gets back to what you kind of said before about partnerships. You know, right. we always talk about partnerships with, like, diabetes, but there's also partnerships with technology. And I think one of the things is that as TV's resources are going down, all of us got to keep our ear to the track and see what's going on around us, what other diseases are using, and what other technologies are out there. And I think this is one of those things, just like with drugs, you know, when we look about new TV drugs, everybody talks about, there's not a lot of drug development for TB specifically, but what we are doing is looking at what other drugs are being developed for other diseases and see how they may be effective. It's the same concept of keeping our ears to the tracks, you know, and listening. And uh, I agree with you; it needs to be justified. Uh, we actually we got a we got a uh, what do you call it? A, a, we got a question from one of your colleagues at the CDC, uh, from uh, Shaywan Colbert. He, they're asking. Uh, First of all, he's saying bad things about you, which I'm going to hold in my pocket here. Uh, no. she, uh, you know, because uh, this way I can use it against you later. No. It says, Dr. Castro, you discussed the need for more effective and comprehensive interactions and case management services for TB patients and TB contacts when interacting with public health workers and physicians. How do you see CDC encouraging these efforts? Um, Tawana is, uh, is a really great asset to the dish. She's relatively new and as you would expect from really good new people, they're asking the challenging questions. The, um, I would uh, suggest that 
uh, in the case of CEC, we reach out to other existing programs. And as uh, she herself and her group have started to do, uh, we need to pay close attention to the ongoing efforts that our national center in terms of program coordination and service integration then go beyond that. In fact, uh, there's a very interesting development uh, that I learned about just a few weeks ago where the folks who work in diabetes prevention control at CDC receive some of the stimulus dollars and are working uh, with us to try to improve the uh, cross collaboration between diabetes and TB programs in the uh, U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands where diabetes rates are rampant and it's a very significant uh, comorbidity. Uh, so we need to see uh, more of that, and that's just looking internally. Then we need to also look externally. Uh, who are the other partners that we haven't uh, tapped? Invite them to the table. Um, and it, it doesn't happen overnight. These are uh, processes that require uh, not only the cultivation of partnerships, but also uh, clarity and focus. Um, and very, all of us who are very busy uh, on our project, I myself get very irritated when I get invited to a session where at the end of the day it's all talk, 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 and no one walks away with concrete actions. I've had enough of those in my life. And so I think we need to start engaging and saying at the end of the day, what is it that we're going to do that's been different from what we've done before? Who's going to be the designated person to follow up on this and who? Uh, is going to be interacting, and so we need to also start giving the formality to the work uh, that goes beyond the chatter that has occurred for years. Uh, but you know, Shawan, I'm looking forward to your contributions in helping us achieve this. You know, obviously, uh, you, you had a lot of provocative statements about MDR and XDR, and we're getting a bunch of uh, questions that I'd like to kind of put together. Uh, so we're getting questions like from Sabim Ahmadov from uh, our bureau and uh, also from Paul Mann. And a lot of them really are relating to things such as having an MDR registry, nationwide registry, and making reporting easily, you know, easier. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest things I think you'd agree is you, keep, you talk a lot, and I think we agree, that don't try this at home. But at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. How you know do you know is there a need is there a is, is it warranted to maybe have an MDR registry where a central you know a central let's say you know bureau or or agency is following all these MDR cases to make sure that they're getting completed I, you know to comment on something you said before that I think is very important is you know um, in Florida when I first when I first got here in 1993 we had 41 cases of MDR. And of them, I'm sorry, 44, of them, 41 of them were homegrown, as you said, something we don't talk a lot about. Now I think we had five cases or so last year, and four of the five were what we call imported. And that's, a, 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 I think, an amazing marker of how a program is doing that we don't talk enough about, you know. And I guess that's the kind of things that may come out with, like, you know, with a registry of MDR. And also, once they were identified, that would maybe give those patients access to the expert care and resources you may be talking about. Uh, absolutely. Uh, we, um, in fact, uh, we recently had a session in our division where we've been doing some uh, strategic uh, work to look at a couple of, um, uh, we call them flagship uh, or initiatives, um, uh, one focusing on how to better prevent uh, future TB cases and the other one on dealing with drug-resistant TB. And the topic of a registry has come up. Um, how to tackle it to make it functional and uh, overcome the predictable uh, obstacles, you know, the safeguarding confidentiality of the individuals, um, making sure that uh, it's used for the right purpose. Uh, I think that that's the way to go. In fact, it's pretty much the only way that we will in the United States be able to enroll um, large numbers of individuals who've been exposed to persons with MDRTB to evaluate alternative uh, treatment for latent TB uh, given a fairly convincing exposure or high likelihood of MDR latent infection. Um, without that, we will forever be 
issuing guidelines on the basis of expert opinion. Well, and, and that's the problem. I, I want to take it one step, and that was going to be the next point, and that, we practiced that really well, Ken, this morning. Good work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, but what I was going to ask you is this whole issue, you know, we keep talking about, well, get expert opinion, expert opinion, but my next question is going to come to you, where are the experts going to be trained, real soon? Because as MDR and XDR goes down in the United States, right, this can be, it's going to be harder and harder to train, quote, unquote, experts, especially when it comes to physicians. At AG Hall. Well, but, what I, well, but what I'm getting at, the advantage is of a place like regional training centers or yes, regional absolutely. care centers and a registry is that it not only will help the patient, but I think it will give opportunities to train, as we talked about before, the future health care providers. I mean, because yes. it's getting harder and harder. I mean, uh, we have one of our fellows here from University of Miami, and they, you know, they're one of the programs that they do rotate through here to learn that, but there's really very little opportunities now for most, quote unquote, you know, future experts to be trained. Right. So, um, I think the, the other thing that we need to do is to uh, transform the settings in which we operate as the places where people want to come work. Uh, you know, I personally, um, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing and about the opportunities ahead of us. If I saw that there was nothing in the pipeline and that we are just going to be doing more of the same, you know what, I would have retired from this. But there's no way you're going to get me out of here at a time when we're at the cusp and about to see the ability to roll out and really transform uh, the care we deliver. I mean, the one, one personal goal I have, I will acknowledge, is I would – Love to bury the tuberculosis skin test as the sole source <laughs> of, uh, uh, yeah, of yeah. identifying latent TB. <laughs> now, I'm not ready to do that until I have something that is absolutely better. And right now, we still have, we have tests that are better in some settings, but not always. And where you have reverses back to negative, where you so we still need to uh, learn a lot more. But I have I've seen this happen in my own career. I, I started working on. AIDS before we knew the etiologic agents of that disease. <laughs> and look at us now, 25 years later. Nice. We have rapid tests. Uh, we have antiretroviral that I cannot keep up with, uh, the list of options for treatment. And that, by the way, is the result of an investment in the research infrastructure to get us there. So we need to also be mindful that as we struggle to maintain this infrastructure, we don't forget the need to uh, provide the resources for the very necessary research, which is going to come to our rescue at some point. But then what you have to do is create an environment where, right. you, bring, where you bring in patients to uh, experts and to absolutely. future experts. Right. You know, where you have, because if you think about medicine as an apprenticeship, right. so what do you do to learn medicine? You have to have the patients. You have to have the people who know how to right. take care of them, and then the people who are training on one side. In fact, uh, what you're offering is a, uh, an unpaid uh, advertisement for the TB Trials Consortium and the right. Epi Studies Consortium, which is a, an, a, a, an effort to bring public health uh, clinics uh, an approximation to uh, the academic institutions and get the bang for the buck and the benefit from the intellectual uh, and where the patients reside, and we both uh, mutually do a better job. Okay, after, well, we just got, you know, I don't know about you, my check just came in for them, so I will say no. Uh, <laughs> No, just these are two practical. Then we're going to go back to a phone, and then uh, we have about five more minutes. But real quick, uh, there's a there's a an instant question here. The, the possible to have is is it possible to have one central TB reporting number rather than finding the county where but the county where the person lives or may have moved away? I guess again the difficulties you're hearing very practical question uh, from our field where you know uh, it, it's hard to find where the person was and is there a way to now with, as we heard. Uh, with better IT and better uh, electronic reporting, I guess one number or a better way to report. Um, I I don't think we're ready for that yet. In fact, um, one of the big uh, issues that we struggle with at CDC is when we get calls, it's redirecting the caller back to the local health department um, who we interact with and partner with. Now, uh, having said that, I think that there may be a time when you could have a system for referral and cost referral that facilitates this. But we're not there yet. And I would hate to see people calling CEC to do these reports and bypassing the local health department folks who could have done uh, the work immediately uh, for them. Uh, so it's a balancing act, and I, I, I certainly have no intention of uh, 
assuming that role uh, in Atlanta uh, at the expense of local health. But uh, what I'm going to do is, if it's okay with you, I'm going to give your, I'm going to give everybody your cell phone number, your home number, so right. they can call you direct. But you'll be the central. Is that all right? All right. All right. Hey, I, I think we have one more operator. I think we have another call on the, uh, another question on the phone, and then we may have one last question. And let me make a statement. Any questions that came in through, uh, and I haven't told Ken this yet. But any questions that come in through the email, uh, we will, if we didn't get to it, we will get them answered for you, either through Ken or one of us. But uh, we really appreciate you guys, uh, you know, your questions, because that's really what makes this. So I think, Operator, we have one more call on the phone line. Is that correct? That's correct. Our next question comes from the line of Sue Lane. Please go ahead. Dr. Castro, Dr. Ashton, thank you. I'm here in Broward County and couldn't come up, but I really appreciate the webcam. Uh, one of my questions was with the limited funding and partnerships that we need, correlating with corrections really would help a, a lot. We were able to identify and uh, work with health departments to do that. I'm wondering how throughout the country this is working and also in the other countries, what the relativity of that would be as far as the amount of TB we see in their prisons. Uh, thank you for your excellent question, a topic that we haven't touched on today. Um, and that's the role that correctional facilities have played traditionally in facilitating transmission of tuberculosis and conversely in facilitating the screening and identification of cases and providing proper therapy. Uh, what I have seen in my years of experience is that the health departments that do best have a designated uh, person who acts as a liaison with the local jail or prison system um, to make sure that the activities that need to take place do take place. There's also the Correctional Health Association. I, I think I have the name not uh, absolutely accurate, but uh, these are groups who we need to be uh, continuously engaged with. Uh, when looking at what's happening globally in places like Russia, it's been very clear, and it's uh, one of the things that uh, Lee Reisman features in his book, uh, Time Bomb, how um, the prison system has been breeding a lot of tuberculosis because there's been unmitigated transmission and there's been a lot of primary MDRTB in those settings. Um, most persons are not incarcerated uh, on life sentences. They ultimately make it back to our communities and uh, those who work in this arena have recognized the need to do a better job at uh, facilitating the interactions between public health and the correctional facilities, not only for tuberculosis, but for so many other uh, communicable diseases also. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you brought it up and my, you know, my response, uh, reiterating what I've already stated, uh, is that in my experience, the programs that work best have designated uh, persons with responsibility working with someone in the correctional facility to make sure that the activities that um, uh, have been recommended are indeed taking place. And also, very importantly, the same way that in the uh, uh, healthcare centers, we want uh, to see uh, advanced discharge planning, not just drop the person without any plan for follow-up with the local health department. The same thing needs to be happening with correctional facilities as uh, inmates are released from the care and uh, have not yet completed their treatment for either uh, TB disease or latent uh, infection. We need a shorter, uh, right as you were st stating, we need a shorter uh, term of treatment. Absolutely, or shorter sentences, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I agree with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for those questions. Ken, I want to start by telling you, Ken, you have just said, a A.G. Holly grand rounds record. You have taken over one hour of questions, which is a record, and you're, you survived it. We have a short view. You, you survived the, the question round. Ken, that was just some, simply, simply outstanding. And I think what's the most important thing that you said, at least from my perspective, is you said something right before that you said that you're looking forward to fighting this till the end. You said you, you're looking forward to the future. I think the biggest problem we had during the, the late 1970s, or early 80s, when TB came back, is people ran from TB. You know, we lost, we lost our infrastructure. And I think one of the things is, as long as we keep the enthusiasm up, as long as we keep it interesting, 
And as long as there's leadership that encourages people to continue in TV till we see our final mission accomplished, we will be there. We will be successful. So, Ken, thank you for everything you do. Thank, thank you. you for your leadership. Thank you for being here. Thank you so, so much. I'm honored. Thank you.